All right, are we recording? Yes, we are. Cool, so uh, welcome everyone who's joined us right now. Uh, there's six of us so far, I'm sure it's gonna keep going up as we go. Um, if you've got any questions for Jeff, please feel free to go to the Q&A tab and leave your questions here. Uh, as I mentioned, there's already been, I think, 14, 15, 16 questions already, Jeff. So already a lot of people are interested to hear your thoughts about a few things. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know who you are, um, how would you usually describe yourself, Jeff? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I was a long-term blogger. Uh, started in 2004, which seems like a long time ago now, although I wasn't one of the earliest, earliest bloggers. That would have been 1999 or 2000. Uh, so sort of one of the second wave of bloggers. And then in 2008, embarked upon building what became Stack Overflow with Joel Spolsky and did that until 2012. Uh, and then so that's when we started the Discourse Project, which is you know open source collaboration forum tool. So that's sort of been the arc of what I've been working on and why you may or may not know who I am. Awesome. I mean, I am, a lot of questions kind of dive into it a little bit anyway, but just just to give a little bit extra context uh, to start out, like how did both of those things, because, you know, they're basically in some way, without picking up too much, they've quite transformed the internet in some ways. Like I'm Stack Overflow, especially, and particularly Discourse is the community side of things. It's really kind of transformed how the internet works in many different ways. Like how on earth did these begin? How did you start out with these things? Well, I the blog got really popular. Um, to the point that, you know, I was working at a traditional job, which I loved. Um, and uh, around, gosh, I don't know, 2006 or 2007, I had hooked up RSS for the first time and found that I had 40,000 subscribers to the blog. That's like a small city, you know? And I was like, wow, that's that's a huge audience to, to talk to. And there was quite a bit of energy there and it became a question of like, well, what do you do with that energy? You know, like it made my day job seem a little bit quaint, you know, like I can go in and impact the small number of people that I work with and the small number of customers that we worked with. Uh, or I could write a blog entry that, you know, 40,000 people would read, see, and, you know, engage with in some way. And it made it feel like I was living sort of the secret life of, you know, Clark Kent and Superman, you know, like I had this quaint day job and then this other thing I was doing on the side that was having this big impact in the world. Yeah. And I wanted to take that energy and turn it into something, but I wasn't sure what. And I started mailing people in the industry that I respected that, you know, had had a good influence on me that, that I thought maybe would have ideas about this. And one of those people that I emailed was Joel Spolsky, who was a pretty famous programmer and had had a blog for a long time. And he, proposed this idea, which became ultimately Stack Overflow. Um, there was this site, um, Experts Exchange, which mm -hmm. is uh, still around, but kind of defunct. But back in 2006 or 2007, it was one of the main Google destinations for programmers if you had programming questions. But it was a bad experience because they were constantly trying to trick you into like signing up and paying to subscribe. And like they would kind of hide the answer to the question in this really sneaky kind of way. And everybody hated it. And Joel brought that up and he's like, well, you know, this is useful, but like, you know, maybe we could do this in, you know, a more ethical community friendly way. And yeah. I really liked that idea a lot. And uh, we really just dug into it. And at that point I sort of quit my job and sort of went off into the great unknown of like, let's build this thing. And, just see what happens. And it was scary because, you know, I was living off savings and um, also realized when I started that it was really hard to do things by myself. I mean, Joel was there, but it was more like just a phone call every week, mm -hmm. which we turned into uh, a podcast, actually. Which, so that turned into a useful exercise. Uh, but I needed someone else, like a buddy system to, yeah. to get things done. So it was interesting to figure that out early on is it's just really hard to do things just absolutely by yourself. Um, and luckily I had friends that I recruited that I had worked with who were very, very talented and kind of underemployed programmers. And once they joined me, um, the project had a lot more momentum and, yeah. you know, became what it became. So, you know, very, very pleased to do that. But that was a really also a very busy, busy, busy time. <laughs> of just trying to build things and see if we get it to work and, you know, scale it. And um, it was quite stressful in a lot of ways. And 
question. I mean, how did you, so in the beginning, you know, you saw like, you know, the, what was it called, the, the other exchange platform? I forget. Uh, Experts Exchange. You saw that was great, but you know, it wasn't working as well as you thought it could be, lots of problems with it. And you were like, we can do that better. We can do that, you know, more ethically and better. Uh, and you took it from there. Yeah, so it was really reacting to sort of an existing problem on the internet, like a thing that wasn't the way it should be. And they're sort of stepping in and saying, well, let's let's build it the way it should be. And that's kind of also what happened with Discourse, because when it came out of Stack Overflow in, uh, gosh, early 2012, which is also when uh, my girls were born, the twins, wow. um, one of the reactions I had was that I would get asked for advice a lot about, oh, we have this thing. Can you look at it and tell us what you think? You know, you've been part of this successful endeavor with Stack Overflow, so you must really know what you're doing, which I may or may not actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and one of the key pieces of advice I would give groups like that is, you know, why are you asking me? You know, ask people that are using your product what yeah. What they think of it you know like your customers your users like you need to be talking to them not me because i may or may not be in the audience for what you're building and i may or may not really even care what you're building you know it's i'm an expert you know air quote expert but uh i'm not the person whose opinion should really matter to you and i gave that advice out a lot and the the smarter groups that I gave it to said, oh, that's great advice, Jeff. So we should listen to our customers and, and users. So how do we do that? And then I realized that um, the software that you would use to talk to people, which we would t think of as a kind of forum, particularly back then in uh, yeah. you know, 2008, 2012, when we were building Stack Overflow, which was really Q&A. It's not, not a forum. People think of it as a forum, but Q&A is, is not that kind of discussion. It's very directed classroom learning kind of stuff. Um, but that more open-ended kind of discussion, all the software to do it was like really bad. Like all the, you know, options were kind of embarrassing to propose yeah. to people. So I realized that there had been so little advance in four years while I was at Stack Overflow of, of forum software, because we had looked at that thinking, oh, Stack Overflow is like a forum, which it really yeah. wasn't. We really spent a lot of time looking at other Q&A platforms, of which there were so, so many that I didn't know about. Um, and that's the early part of the project where you're doing all the research, like figuring out, like, what should we build? How should we build it? Just tons and tons of research. And I had done research then on forums, and I was shocked to discover four years later that there had been, like, virtually no improvement in the forum software ecosystem, and to the point that it was just kind of embarrassing software to, to install. And that was the genesis of the discourse project was like, I want to give people advice and back it up with a tool that lets them talk to their community. That's, you know, a not embarrassing and be like on par with, you know, Facebook and Twitter and the other up and coming giant social networks and places people were already kind of hanging out, you know, cause why would you hang out on like the bulletin, which is just terrible. Um, when you could be some other place that has a lot more amenities, you know, like yeah. it's just this horrible concrete block housing kind of place for people to be, you know. Um, so it was yeah. again reacting to a problem on the internet, which was the software for you know groups interacting with each other was just really, really poor. Um, it sounds like it sounds like you know you, you you had two problems to solve immediately, and you, you know you you almost your your projects were a reaction to those problems. So I mean, we've already had a few questions in the comments which I'll ask first, and then I'm going to jump into some of the questions which were asked before we started. Um, you know, and people knew that you were coming. So Ryan has asked us, um, how obvious was it for you that you could monetize the project uh, the product, and did you start with a monetization or figure out along the way? Um, and I assume that might apply to both, but it's up to you how you want to answer that. Well, I can answer for both. So for Stack Overflow, uh, I was kind of insulated from that. Like Joel's role was to sort of figure out, you know, how we could make money from this. But we did try to be upfront with people with Stack Overflow at yeah. Stack Overflow. Like, look, you know, this is a business. This is a for-profit endeavor. Uh, all the data that you're contributing is Creative Commons. That was the mm -hmm. primary guarantee was that when you give us a question and answer in Stack Overflow, it goes into the corpus that is Creative Commons license. So we can't like yeah. take it away from you. We were really big on offering that um, proof to people. Yeah. So they could feel confident that it wouldn't all get paywalled, you know, 10 years from now. 
Uh, sure. That is a real risk. You can take a bunch of data and it's like, oh, nope, this is now, you know, everybody has to pay to even look at this data. That's happened many, many times in the history of the internet. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, we were like, look, there's going to be ads, there's going to be a jobs board. And we started implementing versions of that fairly early on to give people a taste of what it would be like. So they didn't get the perception that, oh, this will all be free and, you know, Lottie Dial will never have to see an ad and, you know, because programmers really, really hate advertising. <laughs> uh, nobody likes advertising, but, you know, programmers particularly really, really hate it. So we sure. try to be, it's about setting expectations, right? So we tried to do that, tried to be clear about it. And then with this course, uh, it was even more intentional that, you know, there would be a hosting service, like we would do yeah. hosting. And that's how we would, you know, make money and um, got to that pretty early. We got to that. We started the project in 2013. And by 2014, we had the genesis of our hosting platform up and running because awesome. we had to, you know, build the product and test it and all that stuff and beta test yeah. and get it to a point where it was worthy of being sold. <laughs> and uh, but the hosting business was always the plan there. Um from day zero, uh, although Discourse is also completely open source. So you can grab Discourse, yeah. install it yourself. You don't have to pay us the privilege uh, for any kind of privilege of, of doing that. So I yeah. think just again, setting expectations and uh, the plans were slightly different. You know, this this is open source, that wasn't. Um, yeah. And there was more of a focus early on of like getting really comfortable with billing, making money. And whereas on Stack Overflow, I was super insulated from all that stuff. That yeah. was a separate project that ran independently of Stack Overflow itself. Okay, cool. I mean, let me, I'm going to jump onto some of the questions that other people have asked beforehand, but let me just before we do that, um, what, what uh, you mentioned open source a lot and you've mentioned that, you know, keeping the Creative Commons license, it sounds like a lot of what you do is, you know, ethical or, you know, focusing on a more equal um, internet, let's say. Um, where, where does that kind of uh, inspiration come from for you? Where, you know, why are you so inspired for this more equal, more less monolith kind of internet? Um, and where, where do you think that inspiration came from? Well, I think it works better. I think it works better if people on Stack Overflow realize, oh, by spending time on Stack Overflow, I'm not just you know lining the coffers of some giant company. Yeah. I'm actually building part of this giant corpus that anyone can download. Like you can download the complete corpus of Stack Overflow questions and answers. Yeah. Uh, what you can't do is use it to, you know, build a paid version of Stack Overflow. There, the licensing is kind of clear about that, right? Like you can't use our data to compete with us, uh, but yeah. you can use it to analyze the data, you use it to study the data, you can use it for personal reference, you can all that kind of good stuff. So I think people are more willing to contribute if they realize that the rug isn't going to rip, be ripped out from under them at any point, you know, and their stuff will be taken away from them. Um, it's just the right way to do it because you get more honest, more genuine contributors and more contributions. And so that was the rationale at Stack yeah. Overflow. And at Discourse, it's, it's kind of similar. The idea is that communities need to own themselves to really be viable, you know, to be part of a community, you have to have control over your own community you know you have to feel like okay i can't get kicked out of yeah you know this this room that we're renting from mark zuckerberg at sure. any time on a whim like this is our community it runs by our rules um we can host it ourselves if we really need to if push comes to shove and it's a great sales tactic actually on the enterprise side where you know we have you know business insurance and all that fancy stuff you have to have yeah. and soc too uh, but one of the greatest sales propositions of discourse is like look if, if things aren't working out and you don't like the way the hosting works like you can take all your data and host it yourself at any yeah. time you know indefinitely you can fork the project you can run your own custom discourse code and that's written into every contract that we sign you know because yeah. of the nature of the open source software and i think you get better more sustainable communities out of that. And I agree. That's, that's the goal, you know, it just, I it think, just, that's the goal. I think that's what a lot of communities, you know, what I've been exposed to and even my own, it is really, that is the thing. We're, with, we're already thinking, how do we kind of take this from Facebook, from Zuckerberg, for example, and put it to a place where we are, are in control, where we have like the flexibility to build what we want to build without having these walls and this risk that we rely on Facebook's algorithm or, you know, Facebook being shut down one day. So um, I think, you know, what you're, what you're creating is gold. And a lot of people are very interested in moving off of Facebook to find something better. 
Um, all right, let me let me dive into some of the questions which were asked beforehand because uh, there's a bunch here which we're to get through. Um, we'll start one with one from uh, Danielle de Villa from uh, the company Athleta or Athleta, I think it's called. And she said, "How important do you think it is? Um, how important is the community leader um, to the success of an online community? How much does it kind of rely on that leader themselves when it comes to an online community?" Oh, I thought I think we're athletic customers. So that's interesting. <laughs> uh, pretty sure we are. Pretty sure my wife uh, purchases things from Athleta. So that's a cool question. So uh, in the community, so role models and um, participants. So I think when it comes to community, it's about who shows up every day. Mm -hmm. I think is is really important. It's kind of like the old show Cheers. You know, it's like where everybody knows your name. I yeah. think there has to be a core of contributors there. Um, that are visible like frequently. And I think it has to be part of your daily workflow for, for whether, you, you know, whether you work at the company or whether you're a customer. Um, I think that's really critical. I think that's really the backbone of most communities is this idea of sort of daily participation, you know, like this is a normal place I go to listen to what customers are saying yeah. about our brand, to listen to what customers are sharing about our brand uh, to interact with customers and also to interact with my team. Like the way we do it at Discourse, now we run multiple discourses. We have meta.discourse.org, which is the public place you would go mm -hmm. if you're just using Discourse, you know, whether you host, whether we host you or not, and you have a question about Discourse, that's where you go to get it answered. We run an internal discourse for internal company discussions that are, you know, just, you know, inside baseball kind of stuff that would only matter to us as an organization. Yeah. But I do really encourage everybody at Discourse to, interact as much as they reasonably can on the public uh, meta.discourse.org as sure. leaders within the community. So there's evidence that, I mean, imagine if you went to a community and like nobody from the company was ever there, you know? Yeah. It's like, well, what are you really doing here? <laughs> yeah. This is just a place for the customers <clears throat> to kind of talk to each other, but we don't really have any voice. We don't have any representation here within the company. Nobody's really listening to us. and ferrying those messages back and forth to the people that have power. So I think having people of manifest power in your community in your community is strong evidence that you actually believe in the community. It's like part of your daily workflow. It's a place that you normally go and um, it's a part of your daily routine as someone who works at the company as an official representative of the company. And that's that can be a tough sell. Um, we try to talk companies into doing this, but it's, it is real work, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's not free. <laughs> um, totally. so you have to be kind of an enlightened company to kind of get it and want to do it. But for the companies that we work with that do, they have generally really outstanding results, but the community can also fight you on stuff. You have to be careful. It's not free. Totally. You know? Yeah, I think that's also key is like sometimes participating as a brand is like, a you know, you don't always know how to participate. And I know your, your personal representations of the brand, but sometimes people are a little bit apprehensive, like, how do I do this? And it feels kind of false. People have to find their voice first as the community leader or, or just the individuals within the brand before it really can kind of hit off and feel natural, like a natural conversation. Um, Deb here, uh, who's live, she said, um, do you define the leader? Um, do you define the leader as a community host? Or community manager they could be the same person or a team of people um yeah how, who, how would you define the leader of a community uh jeff i think it's just the people who show up the most i mean it could be the customers even um i think those are the the leaders within the community but i think you also need power within the organization yeah. and um you don't typically give that to your customers, right? I mean, you can recognize customers who are active in the community. And one thing we do actually at Discourse, it's a little bit of an open secret, is every six months we pick somebody within the community we like on Meta and we send mm -hmm. them an iPad Pro because it's like, hey, cool. Thank you for you know being such a you know active member of this community. And then those people can kind of come and go like, you know, over the years. Some of them are still here, some of them aren't. Um, but it's just a way of rewarding your key contributors. And it's it's a surprise. We don't say when you join Meta, yeah. it's like, well, if you just participate here enough, you'll get an iPad Pro because that would send the wrong message. Yeah. Um, but there's ways of rewarding people who are really, really active within the community and really helpful. Um, and I think yeah. leadership is is what you make of it. I think it's whoever shows up, whoever puts in the work, and who, whoever is is getting things done. You know, Definitely. It, 
yeah stuff like stuff like this jeff stuff like the rewarding people with this this ipad and you know even some of the um the badges and stuff which you've got into in in discourse like how how much of this did you learn as you went along like how did you kind of learn this um almost this playbook of of dealing with communities and yeah how did you learn these things well i think with stack overflow it was more about gamification of like treating it like um a way of getting peer recognition and stack overflow there's a number next to your name we don't do this at discourse for because it's a different system but that number represents peer recognition you know it's yeah. not from the system it's like other programmers saying hey that's a good answer that makes sense i'm gonna vote for that you get reputation for that um so there's like a number next to everyone's name and it's meant to motivate people of like oh wow i'm being recognized by my peers for being helpful yeah. being knowledgeable and there's aspects of that in discourse, but it's more of a an iceberg type system. We we it's not quite as overt. It's a little more buried. Um, you have likes on posts, of course, and you can see people's most liked posts. You can get badges, things like that. But we kind of shied away from putting a number next yeah. to people's names because we didn't want it to be that strong of a motivator. Sure. Um, it's a more open ended system, and it it's more about discussion and less about you know directed learning. So we didn't want it to be quite so pushy in the way that it was um, uh, motivating people. And how, how much of that was trial and error? How much of that was, you know, how do you find the right incentives to, to kind of reward the right behavior in a community? And how did you come across it? What worked and what didn't work? I think when we started Stack Overflow, we looked at all the systems that were out there. And this was in 2008, so a while mm -hmm. ago. But we looked at Dig, we looked at Reddit, we looked at Wikipedia, we looked at blogs. And we tried to pull in, it was like building this Frankenstein monster of like all the motivational things that seem to work um, without the baggage parts. Um, but you do, of course, get some of the baggage parts, you know, like, and, and you still, we don't necessarily struggle with that at discourse because it's just a more open-ended system. It's meant to serve yeah. so many different purposes. But at Stack Overflow, for example, one thing we struggled with is this influence from Wikipedia where there can only be really one article on a given very specific subject so we don't really you can't have duplicates i mean you, it, it, it's challenging to to navigate that and to say to someone well this is a duplicate question like somebody else already asked this question sure um because you shouldn't really be getting reputation from a duplicate and things like that so we absorb some tension that's an example from the wikipedia model um that we didn't adopt at discourse although there is there is a wiki post model but mm -hmm. the reputation system makes it really powerful um, okay. and sort of weaponizes it in, in a lot of ways that can cause awesome. strange behaviors. Yeah. And I mean, sticking with, it's kind of related. Um, somebody um, asked us beforehand, they said, um, it's Pat Cooney from Pronto Forms. Uh, they ask, uh, what metrics do you look at to understand um, not only the community health, but also the overall return on investment of a community? Like, what are the metrics you could see to see how healthy a community is? Um, and, you know, if you're trying to, hey, Pat's here, actually, Pat's on live on the call. Um, if, if um, you know, what metrics would you look at to see, see health? And also, especially a lot of us are trying to kind of get stakeholders, stakeholders on board with this inside of an organization. And what kind of metrics could be used as a return on investment for a community, do you think, in your experience? Well, that's one thing that we have struggled with a little bit is uh, the, the sales value of community. It, it's difficult to point to community as a thing that makes money for you as a business. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you're dealing with sort of enlightened companies, they can see the big picture of, you know, building customer value and, you know, having customers that are advocates and things like that, um, you can make headway if you have an enlightened yeah. customer. But it's kind of hard to, you know, bring companies around to that way of thinking, you know, like yeah. it, it is a baseline of like, how does this make us additional money? And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that sentiment. They're not wrong to say that. It's just community is a very roundabout way of making money. I mean, if you look at, for example, a company like Zappos and that tragic thing yeah. that happened to the founder, which was very, very sad, uh, but they were very, very customer centric. Like that was their whole deal, you know, yeah. that you could buy all these shoes, return a whole bunch of them and it was all cool. And um, they developed this whole brand that was based on being just super, super customer centric. And that was one of their innovations, you know, like not many companies were really doing that. So it can be a difficult thing to to sort of teach to companies, to explain, to, and to also yeah. to sell to them. But as far as measuring sort of direct health of a community, 
I think part of it is like walking into a restaurant uh, for the first time is like, is the restaurant open? First of all, yeah. <laughs> Does it look deserted? <laughs> are there people eating there? Do those people look reasonably happy? Um, are they getting reasonable service? I mean, you can almost just take a snapshot on any given day of like, what sure. does it look like in this community? You know, like if, because people are walking in every day, looking around and saying, what is this place? How does this work? And if they're seeing a ghost town, you know, if they're seeing yeah. people being rude to each other, <laughs> if they're seeing, you know, people getting bad service, I, I think that's the day-to-day -day stuff that I worry about is, you know, do you have new people coming in uh, at a reasonable basis? Mm -hmm. um, what's the quality of the conversation? Like if you just sampled five recent conversations from today, what do they look like? Are they interesting? Mm -hmm. Are they stuff other people would want to look at? Yeah. Um, do they sort of represent your brand in a reasonable way? Is it just a bunch of people yelling at each other? <laughs> sure. Uh, those kind of things. Like I'm a big believer in just sort of the daily sample of like. Okay. Because you know. Pat's given us a little bit more context. This is on the call. He said he's currently got executive buy-in um, from, you know, the executives. Uh, what he wants to ensure is that he maintains that as the community grows. Um, you know, it isn't something unlike, you know, a marketing campaign where you can see, oh, this ad has this many sales, for example. It's not always so clear that community has that same direct link, right? So I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. Uh, have you got any other thoughts about that? I, I loved your ideas about, you know, taking a snapshot of the day, looking at, you know, how many people are in, how many people are staying in. Um, is there anything else you could say about, um, you know, maintaining this buy-in as the community develops and grows, for example? Sure. So I think the idea is you're creating these artifacts that have some value over time. So mm -hmm. I would look at sort of your greatest hits as a community, like from in discourse, there's this thing called top. So you can do top by week, by month, by year. Okay. So look at your top topics and see, like, are you generating value there? You know, like not every conversation will be, you know, yeah. the, the most useful conversation. That's fine. But you should be generating some pearls, you know, yeah. from your oysters every so often of like really good conversations that other customers would see and be inspired by like, oh, wow, this brand is really great. Like, look at this fantastic interaction or look at this detailed information about the product I'm getting from this this forum post or, you know, this this kind yeah. of public customer interaction is so nice. You know, it's like the same reason you go to Amazon and you read the Amazon reviews, right? Yeah. You know, what do other people actually think of this product? You know, like, does, yeah. and if the, the reviews are good, then that is a sales tool. For so sure. I think I would point to, you know, you know, are you generating pearls on a regular basis or at least, you know, semi-regularly? And do you have sort of a regular influx of steady participation? Yeah, um, I, I would say that's that's the primary goal. And whether you want to blow it up big, I don't know. Um, it really depends on the community. Um, but I think to me, that's that's the baseline. It's like, are you as a company getting value out of it? Um, yeah, those are the things, those specific things that that I would look at and, and point to. It's like, yes, we're getting value out of it. I that. love that. And I think that's, you know, that's two major frustrations about Facebook is that with a Facebook community, the polls don't rise to the top. They just get lost in this massive noise, which is quite difficult to search and dif difficult to backlog and stuff like that. So it's, you know, that's why Facebook is limited from that perspective. Um, and it's very difficult to measure the pearls on Facebook, let's say. Um, cool. Thanks for that. And uh, I think Pat's also very, he said thank you for that, that answer as well. It's very useful. So uh, oh, yeah, great, great job. Um, let me see what else we've got here. So we've got, uh, that was Pat. Um, we've got one by Jacob uh, Borgson, Borgson from Chorus, and he says, uh, what's the number one most in, most important thing you need for a successful community in your eyes? Uh, what do you think, Jeff? Uh, activity. I mean, uh, yep. mainly it's just you got to avoid ghost towns. And I think a lot of the product decisions we've made um, in the last four or five years have been about like gently guiding communities towards generating activity. Um, even to the point where we don't do this with uh, the main discourse product. We have a new product discourse for teams where we actually seed conversations because it's a smaller group oriented product yeah. um, with like icebreaker topics every so often of just, you know, fun things to discuss amongst a, a smaller group of people Sure. Uh, to make sure that, you know, there's, there's something interesting to sort of sink your teeth into when you, when you get in there, it's not just, you know, coming to a blank page. I think that's the number one thing that you want to avoid is <laughs> going into an empty restaurant where there's just no customers is, is is quite daunting. And one of the pieces of advice I give people is, you know, 
if you can live your team life in public a little bit, like we do a lot of this at discourse, you can go to meta discourse and see a lot of live discussion about features we're planning to build, you know, and that isn't a private discussion. It's a public discussion. There may be parts of it that are private, but we try to keep as much of that in the public eye as possible. So you can see our release schedule. You can see the yeah. versions of software we're working on. You can see topics about specific features that are in development. Um, you can really get a sense that, you know, even if there were no customers here, you're dealing with the, the product team. You know, you, yeah. your team, the team itself is using it. It's part of their daily routine uh, okay. to go in and check that. Yeah, I mean, it, Ryan's, um, you kind of asked that a little bit from that, but Ryan here is asked to avoid a ghost town. How do you avoid that kind of chicken and egg problem? And I, I'll just kind of follow on from that, which is like, yeah, is it something which a community leader or community manager should stimulate? Is it to do with like the topic itself? Like we need, to, if you haven't found a, a topic where people want to discuss this thing, you haven't found the right community for you, or is there something between these two things that you'd kind of mentioned there? How can you kind of try and avoid that ghost town situation, do you think? Well, I, I would say, again, you're relying on your own teammates, the people that uh -huh. actually work at the company to come in and sort of seed the discussions. And I mean, even talk about the product if necessary, um, you know, like just have have it be part of your team's daily routine to do that. And then customers will follow along and join in, you know, like I think you can't really rely on individual users. I mean, you could recruit some power users. Yeah, that you kind of fet with like uh, special privileges and, you know, come in and help us be a moderator on the site. Um, people that are especially trusted early on could be, you know, sort of your allies in building up your community. But I think without a daily routine of your team going on the public community and interacting with each other and interacting with the product, um, it, it's going to be challenging. You know, I think sure. you have a commitment, you need a commitment internally to do it just for yourselves. Um, yeah. And this is the part of the sales that can be difficult because you're really telling companies they need to be living their lives more in public, which can be a hard sell. You know, it's kind of challenging to put yourself out there a little bit on a public site um, with your product. Uh, but if you can, you'll reap tremendous benefits. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think you can try, try that. Yeah, I think it comes down to, you know, having... I play, basically, it's all, community is all about conversation, right? And I guess the ghost town is avoided by having something worth talking about. And for, whether it's your team discussing really important things about what you're working on, whatever uh, problems you're trying to solve, or if you're a more public community trying to deal with something else, you know, some of the best communities are somebody who's got a problem and they want to share it with a bunch of other people about how can we over this problem, overcome this problem together. And I think, you know, conversation is the key. And if people have got something to talk about, it's, it's a great place to start with running any community. Um, we've got one about changing path a little bit here. We've got one about the actual um, the community industry in general. So Andy, uh, I think it's McLuhan McLuhan from GoDaddy. He's asked, uh, the community industry is taking off. Um, where did you where do you see discourse fitting into this expanded marketplace? Um, how would you answer that, Jeff? Well, I I would say that you know discourse was a little bit of a reaction to two things. It was a reaction to the idea that forum software really hadn't evolved yeah. from two thousand. Uh, eight to 2012 which really surprised me at all and then a secondary reaction was i didn't really want a world in which facebook owned everything you know i, I yeah. wanted this diversity of you know thought and diversity of location and diversity of opinion where not everything belongs to to, to facebook and twitter so i really encouraged companies to to you still have to be on facebook you have to be on twitter that's that's a given i'm not saying don't do that and mm -hmm. there's there's reasons to have centralized platforms like that. I'm not saying there shouldn't be centralized platforms. What I'm saying is that there should be more than that. You know, there should yeah. also be a space that you own that actually belongs to you, <laughs> that you can control and you can set the rules, um, and that you know you reap all the benefits from. And I think that's the long-term strategic investment: is you don't outsource things that are strategic. And I think. The relationship with your customers is incredibly strategic. Um, it can also be challenging, you know, if you're fighting with your customers, which definitely sure. happens. Um, but that's the the value prop that you're you're trying to sell is that you long term want to own this as a company because it's strategic yeah. for you. And you know, 
outsourcing it to some other company is fine. It's like, oh, just go to Reddit, you know, or go to Facebook and yeah. do it all there. But like, you don't, you don't really get all the benefits from that, you know. Sure. Like it, it, Reddit does, you know. I'll follow on from this thing because actually, um, Jen from she's from OpenSource.com and Red Hat. She's got uh, quite a relevant question too. She says, um, in let's say in switching from Facebook to Discourse or even just starting Discourse for the first time, um, how much do you think preparing your community for Discourse matters to its success? Like, is it important we kind of help train people as they go along, or is it something which they could kind of? Do you find people just f take it to like a, a what is the phrase like a duck to water and can kind of just go along and the success of it is relevant just because it's a great product? But how would you kind of take that uh, perspective? I think it depends if you're starting from a particular different software. And you have mm -hmm. a really long established community, there can be quite a bit of uh, resistance to change, mm -hmm. uh, which is just human nature. It's like, this is what we're used to. It has changed. Therefore, I don't like that. Where we see like more generalized success is when you're starting from nothing, where you just add a community and there wasn't one before. There's usually tremendous enthusiasm. It's like, wow, this is really cool. This is fun. You know, because discourse is designed to be fun. You know, it's designed to be engaging. It's designed to be um kind of like a, a party that you're throwing yeah. uh like a dinner party you know not sure. maybe, a, maybe a dance party not but like a dinner party at, at minimum uh so there's plenty of fun elements in discourse that can carry it along but if you're dealing with expectations i think it's really important to like be gentle with your community about those kind of changes that are coming warn yeah. them in advance like oh we're having this change here's a site you can look at we're going to make it look like the old community um you know ape some some aspects of the design so it's not so yeah. jarring it's not like you know such a radical change so in that case i think it depends what you're working with when you start if you're starting mm -hmm. from scratch uh yes we've seen really good uptake uh, discourse is fun discourse is engaging uh if you're starting from an established community i think setting the tone warning about the change uh giving people place to practice uh, you know you're recruiting power users over early yeah. Uh, as allies is really important in that case. So you have other people that are familiar with it that can help others and, you know, share information. But we do see this, like we had one site, um, ironically, which was in the blog post, which I, when I announced uh, discourse, uh, mm -hmm. the, the straight dope forums, which have been around a very long time. And I was always very, I, I just liked this use case because it was these really smart people talking about, um, just really interesting stuff. It was like a great yeah. example of a forum. So I used it in the blog post. They eventually switched to discourse, um, which was kind of ironic as they were in the blog post as an example <laughs> of a community that hadn't changed and was still on really, really old software. So that was sure. really a feather in our cap to have that. But one thing I noticed uh, when I went over there and participated a little bit early on uh, is that the community members were helping each other figure out discourse. You know, they would be very helpful. It's like, oh, here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. Uh, and I would jump in occasionally um, and offer advice, um, you know, tips and stuff. And but it was pretty cool to see several topics in the meta discussion or the, you know, about this site discussion of like, how do I do this? Where the community was answering it like, you know, as good as I could or better. Um, that was really, really encouraging. And I do yeah. think you can see that by getting, you know, your power users up to speed early. Uh, so they can jump in and help people with questions about, oh, the software has changed. I, I don't really understand how this thing works. How do I do this? And yeah, that's quite powerful. Nice. I love that. Um, and I love, you know, the best practices you mentioned about getting power users over first. Is there any, anything else you've noticed which which really um, does a good job at kind of getting people integrated? Let's say somebody's going from a pretty good Facebook community. There's several thousand engaged people there. Um, any other best practices which you've noticed in getting them over to Discourse and uh, enjoying your software? Well, initially we were down on conversions. We were like, oh no, just start from scratch. But over time we've come around the idea that, you know, converting the data is quite critical so that people can come over and find all the old discussions and, yeah. you know, they don't feel like they've lost anything or that the old site was archived. I mean, it depends what your goals are. Sometimes the old site needs to be archived because it's just yeah. you know, ancient data that's not really useful or the world has changed or things like that. But having the comfort food of your old topics there and your old discussion uh, can be quite reassuring for people that, you know, they're coming there and they haven't lost anything. There's no loss sure. version. So I think we've, we've become more and more open to that over time of like, okay, let's do a conversion, even though conversions can be quite challenging. You know, every conversion yeah. is its own special snowflake, even if you're dealing with, 
you know, the same software in theory, there's always tweaks, there's always, you know, things that have to be adjusted in the, in the migration of the data across. Uh, so that's never something that we do for free. In fact, we only do conversions for like a year long business contract. That's like the minimum yeah. um, price for a conversion from us. <laughs> it's pretty pain in the ass to achieve, I guess. Well, it's just, it's, it's a big jump. You know, we, we, yeah. we need a commitment of a certain, at least a year on the business hosting to, to, totally. to do it. And that, that's assuming it's a known piece of software, right? If it's a bespoke conversion, then it's uh, even more because, yeah. you know, we haven't seen that software before and we have to write conversions. Makes sense. Software. And I think, you know, using your metaphor for, um, you've used it quite a few times, like it's, it's a restaurant or your favorite diner or it's a dinner party. I think, you know, as long as people feel, know why you're moving to a different place, let's say you're expanding the place. It's just, if you mentioned like real life, it really makes sense, right? Oh, we're, we're going somewhere else. Here's what you expect. This can be just as comfortable as before. So some, sometimes I think we get lost in thinking that um, the online communities are different, very different to the stuff we interact with every day. But actually, like you said, the, the most successful online communities are the ones you do come up to every day just like your local coffee shop your local restaurant stuff like that and feeling like that sometimes helps us to realize actually it's just communi communication and community in general um yeah for sure like your favorite menu items are still here the people that you yeah. eat with are still here the stuff that matters is still here it's just you know more and nicer modern amenities like for one of Ooh, our customers, <laughs> for one of our customers like being able to use unicode was a huge treat you know and to yeah. us, that's like that's been built in since v1 yeah. Uh, but to them, it's like, oh, God, we can use emojis now. Yay, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've got one One just came through live. A couple of questions came through live, actually. Um, Harleen here, she says, uh, oh, it just skipped. Hold on. Harleen said, uh, it's very, so right now she's working for a government sector and nonprofit organization, and it's difficult to showcase and engage uh, the value proposition to them. Um, have you got any ideas? We kind of touched upon this a little bit earlier. Any ideas how we can um, help kind of suggest the value of a community to, let's say, other stakeholders um, in order to get them to collaborate? And it sounds like, unlike um, unlike before, where they're already on board, this sounds like it's pre-on board. So have you got any ideas about how to get people on board with just the idea of community itself and what we could do to persuade them? I think for that, it, it can that is difficult. I mean, I think that's the primary difficulty in trying to sell the concept of community is you know, how does this impact our bottom line? You know, how does this yeah. make, our, make us better? How does this make us money? And I think the best way to show that is really to use discourse internally um, as a tool for teamwork, which is always how we have I mean, we're kind of biased because that's always how we've used discourse. But a lot of the recent features, if you look at our new product discourse for teams, um, a lot of the plugins and stuff that's configured is about teamwork. It's about scheduling mm -hmm. work. It's about assigning work. It's about making sure things get done, nothing gets dropped. It's about having public-ish conversations, but on a private team. Like it's it's a more yeah. privacy-oriented model. It's like uh, here's ten people that work together a company. We're trying to get this thing done, and you know here's how we talk to each other and and get this done. Rather than using email, rather than using yeah. Facebook, it's like you kind of eat your own dog food. Just like well, let's try using discourse for solving some of the problems we have as an organization today. And I think that's a stepping stone. If you can do that, then you can also say, well, and then we could extend this to the outside world and get, they could get some of the same benefits of sort of working alongside us, you know, not directly at the company, but like getting customer input can be really, really valuable and having customers see what you're doing and being transparent about what you're doing is a great sales tool. You know, it's just um, a little bit more abstract than, you know, this makes us $50 per month. <laughs> yeah. It's more of like brand uh, awareness. It's more of like, you know, loyalty to the brand. It's more like commitment to the brand um, and having some of your customers be your greatest advocates. You know, like I think at any company, you they ask for references like, well, before we do business with you, we need to see. Uh, talk to other customers that have done business with you and see yeah. how they feel about you. Well, if you have a public site, you'd say, okay, well, you can just go to our public site and you can see tons of people interacting with the project. You can see like sort of our attitude, how we work. Um, it, it's a really powerful sales tool um, and has a lot of analogs and traditional, you know, customer reference type stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if you're trying to get somebody, you know, if you're trying to get stakeholders on board, like let's say the, the executives to come on board with this, 
um, you know, what, what, what do you think your advice would be to, to Harleen, like kind of just to show them almost how it works? What, have you got any metrics or anything you can think about or any um, tangible things that she could kind of go to them and say, hey, this is what we could expect maybe from, from like if once you've got the community up and running? Sure. I mean, there's a very comprehensive uh, dashboard uh, in discourse of, of statistics of like, you know, here's how many people are coming. Here's how many posts are being made. Here's yeah. what kind of retention you have. Uh, all that stuff is like right on the discourse uh, dashboard. Uh, so I think, you know, experimenting with the tool and it is free. Like, and the thing with trials that's funny is like, we have to constantly explain to people that like, we actually do mean free trial. Like we have to, we mention it like so many places in our trial setup <laughs> yeah. uh, that like, look, we're actually not going to charge you. Like until you press the charge me money button, like literally press the button. <laughs> we promise we will not charge you. And like every day we have to reassure people like, you know, make sure my thing gets canceled. Cause I don't want to get charged. Like, no, 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 we're not going to charge you. Trust me. We're, <laughs> we're really not going to charge you. We really mean it because that well has been so thoroughly poisoned by like every sure. other company that like, Oh, and if you sign up and give us your info, then we just start charging you. It's like, well, we don't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to actually push the button. So if you want to just like mess around with this course and see the dashboards and see the information or, you know, even the team's product, it's the same way. Like we're not going to start charging you ever, ever, ever until you explicitly push the button. So I think for looking at, you know, how does this work? What kind of metrics can I get out of it? I would say just, you know, start a free trial and, um, you know, play with it, you know, and experiment okay. and, and, and see it. I think that's much more compelling. We also have a bunch of customer, like we have the traditional customer reference page. You can click through to a bunch of discourse sites that are live and active and see, well, is this working for company X? Is this working for company Y? What does yeah. it look like? Uh, those kinds of things you can point to. Uh, but for me, it's about solving problems. It's like, you know, our, our 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 teamwork as we're a fully remote distributed team since day one at Discourse. Yeah. We have people in like fourteen or fifteen different countries and ten different time zones. <laughs> so we're sort of living proof that this is a tool you can use to have really great remote teamwork. You know, and remote teamwork is something that is particularly hot right now. <laughs> um, For sure. But to us, that's always been the future. If you looked at the future of work, it wasn't you know, 30 people in the same room. It was 30 people distributed across the world who are very, very good at what they do. Yeah. Um, that was the future of work and that's the vision. And using discourse is a living example of that. It's like, how do we get things done when we're not in the same time zone? How do we get things done when, you know, we're not all in the same room and, you know, we need to schedule work. And a lot of it is really storytelling. I would say the central basis of discourse is the idea that, you work through storytelling. The unit of work mm -hmm. is the paragraph or the sentence. So if you have a culture of people that are willing to write things, yeah. they're gonna do really well on discourse. Like discourse is a writer's dream. Like one of our customers is uh, the NaNoWriMo, the National November Writing Month. Is oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they love discourse because they're native to what our essential message is, which is, storytelling is how you work. <laughs> uh, and it, it's a very natural way to work. And I think one of the best ways to work, because as humans, we strive to build narrative. Like we got to tell a story about why we're building this feature or why we're doing this thing we're doing. And that's what gives our life meaning. Like you tell sure. the story to make sense of what you're doing. And without the storytelling, like you, you're, you're kind of lost. So yeah, I would say experiment with it, play with it. Our trials are truly absolutely free. <laughs> and then hopefully you can bring other people on board who are similarly uh, engaged and believe in like, you know, storytelling as a form of, you know, getting shit done. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because we believe awesome. deeply in that. And yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more live. Just to give everyone a heads up, probably got about 10 minutes to go. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer than, than that, Jeff, either. Okay. Um, Brian has just written live. Um, I, have you ever heard of the 99 uh, and 1 rule? 90% like of your uh, users view, 9% uh, engage, 1% uh, super users. Have you seen this to be true on your platform, Jeff? And have you, have you heard of that rule? Yes, that's definitely something we saw at Stack Overflow, for sure. Mm -hmm. And one thing we try to track, and one thing I learned while I was at Stack Overflow is um, measuring engagement of people who don't have accounts or don't sign up. Um, one thing, let me give you a specific example. One, one 
feature we instituted on Discourse, or excuse me, on Stack Overflow was people who weren't logged in could still click the upvote button, but it was counted a different way. Like it was counted, mm -hmm. but a, a different pool that wasn't shown. And one okay. of the most interesting things, and this is actually came from one of my co-founders, Sam Saffron. It was his idea. And this is one of the reasons he's one of the co-founders because he constantly has fantastic ideas like this. <laughs> um, and he was right. Once we started recording that, we got all this really interesting data from people who you would never have heard from before because they didn't like sign yeah. up. And one of the most fascinating things about that is if we looked at the data, if there was a big disconnect between what the lo the logged in users were saying with votes, up and down votes, and what the non-logged in users were saying was always evidence that you had a huge problem. It was a fantastic metric of pointing to questions and answers that there was just something wrong with them. Like they needed mm -hmm. human intervention, like editor intervention, because all the random people arriving there through Google or whatever, we're like, whoa, this is not right, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we weren't getting any of that data until we started measuring that. So I believe that. And I think tools like that where you can kind of ambiently measure. And one thing we do in discourse is, of course, page views, right? Like, uh, in fact, one of the features we put in for me, I'm kind of a deletionist when it comes mm -hmm. to our own site. Everybody does their own thing, you know? But for me personally, if it's old data and it's from, it refers to a version of discourse that like is three years old that no one's ever gonna look at anymore, then yeah. I just delete it. I'm like, this is, we don't need this. Like, just delete it. We'll, it, it it'll come back. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but I realize like, I don't wanna do this if there's like more than 5,000 views on the topic, I need to be a little more careful. So one of the features I put in for me was like, if you click the delete button on a topic and that topic has 5,000 plus views, we're like, whoa, you know, we pop up a dialogue that says, all right, whoa, this has a lot of views. You might have a lot of traffic coming in here that you could redirect somewhere else, right? Do you want to just edit this instead to improve it? And that was a reminder to me actually, because I'm kind of a deletionist that, you know, even if I'm deleting something that's old and from my viewpoint, irrelevant to the product yeah. now, um, it's still getting a lot of juice from people arriving there from the outside. So yeah. I do think that's true. And I do think it's important to build features that work for sort of the silent voices, as well as the the people who are engaged and logged in. I think you have to view that as two interrelated audiences. I think that's a really great point. And it's a subtlety of product design that's easy to miss. Like it's easy to design completely for logged in users and kind of forget you have this other much, much larger audience of people who will never log in, but yeah. will visit your content and judge you for it in a good or bad way, right? Yeah, brilliant. And, no, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I uh, hope that answers your question, Ryan, as well. I know, I know in particular, I'm good friends with Ryan, in fact, and I know he's, um, you're talking about writing apps earlier. He's, he's got his own writing app, so I'm sure he's eagerly writing notes about this um, to, yeah, to, to apply to his own app. So thanks for that, Jeff. Um, let me see, we've got a few more questions. I'll, I'll throw you a few more questions before we finish up. Sure, thank you. Um, there's a few actually about the industry in general, and then there's one which I really want to end with, uh, which I'll ask you. So just a quick one about uh, recent news. Uh, Garrett here says, uh, what do you think of Salesforce's recent acquisition of Slack? What do you think it means for the industry? And you, yeah, what does that mean for you, do you think? Uh, my overall reaction is negative. Um, I, I just think it could be worse. I mean, it could have been Oracle or IBM, I guess. In that Facebook. Case. Or Facebook. <laughs> Um, it's not ideal. Like, I don't think this is going to be good in the long term. Um, mm -hmm. I, but it also remains to be seen. It could be like the way when Amazon brought Zappos, since I've talked about Zappos earlier and the, that yeah. massive cu customer centric focus they had, which was really rare and still is kind of rare. They just left them alone. You know, they didn't like change their entire culture. It kind of yeah. depends how Salesforce handles this. If they just let them be just building a bunch of integrations, it could be okay. Um, but it points towards, I guess, the difficulty of, I guess, the narrative was that, you know, Microsoft Teams was kind of eating their lunch. Yeah. Um, and my perspective is that chat tools are a kind of short-term memory. They're important, but there's two types of memory, short-term and long-term. Discourse is not trying to be a chat tool. We're yeah. We have chat-like flavors in places, yeah. but we're trying to be the long-term memory for your organization, yeah. which I think is a very different and much more valuable role. Whereas the short-term memory, even at Discourse, we've switched chat tools like I think four times 
And every time we did, we just completely threw away chat history. We just didn't even care. We we're sure. like, just change, like, don't care. Um, yeah. The only thing that mattered were like the integrations sometimes. Uh, and that's like just a couple days of work of getting the integrations to change. So one of the problems with chat as a tool is that it's just kind of disposable. It's kind of interchangeable. Like any, any tool can do chat. Like it's just short-term memory. It's not meant to be this huge, important repository of information. And if you treat chat as this hugely important thing, you're kind of screwing up. The best companies that use chat, like Stripe, for example, mm -hmm. has a strict policy that all chat is deleted after six months. And we do the same okay. thing. We delete all of our chat messages every six months just because okay. for liability reasons and also to send home the message of like, look, this is not long-term memory. If you're putting yeah. things in here you need to refer to after six months, you're screwing up. Like, <laughs> this is not the right tool for that. Yeah. Um, it's an important tool because you need short-term memory. I mean, if you lived your life without short-term memory, you would be a crazy person, right? Um, yeah. And ditto if you had no long-term memory. It would be like, you know, those movies where people don't have long-term memory. <laughs> Uh, Memento is the movie, I think. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, you, you need both of these things, but one of them is much easier to replace than the other. So it's just a risky business segment, in my opinion. So Okay, makes sense. I know, you know, so it kind of, you know, like, like your whole philosophy in general is not big businesses getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but, you know, having these silos of smaller businesses owning their own space and kind of doing their own thing. So, you know, anything which reduces the monopoly, I think, is, uh, I guess, better off for, for everyone in general. Um, I think we're almost at the end. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll probably finish off. I'll ask two things. I'll ask if anybody still watching has got any last questions for you. And if not, I'm going to finish up with my last question for you in the meantime. Sure. Um, Jeff, I really wanted to know, you know, you've had such a big success and a big impact in, say, online community. Um, do you think that your, from your perspective and from your experience of the last 12 years, do you think how much of it is strategic and how much of it is serendipitous? And, you know, how does that look for you? Like, how how could you um, just, not justify, how can you kind of, um, why do, where do you, think, do you think your success in this field has come from? Well, there's a couple things. I have a blog post where I talk about um, why I think things worked. And there's a, there are themes that I've talked about in, 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 in the questions that have already been asked. One is, mm -hmm. do things in public when you can. Mm -hmm. So you can get the benefit of people seeing that you're doing this thing and you can point to it. It's like, oh, look what I did. It's right here. Yeah. Everyone can see that I did this thing. Not to show off, but just that you have evidence that you you can yourself can go back and look to it. It's like your own research notebook of like, what was I doing a year ago? Well, I could I can go to my meta <laughs> discourse and tell you, here's what I was doing. One year ago. Yeah. Uh it's a kind of memory. It's like a research notebook. It's good. Um for that reason. Uh, and also just like putting in the work, like this isn't an overnight thing. Like when we started Discourse, I said, look, okay, this is a five-year mission. And then within six months, I was like, okay, it's actually a 10-year mission, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it just takes that amount of time to really change things. Like nobody's going to immediately jump and, you know, take this new software and migrate their whole community to it. You know, that takes yeah. a, a big ask. And the, the software needed a lot of time to harden, to get better, to improve. We needed a lot of time to mold the software into something that was really good. And, you know, you make a lot of mistakes in the beginning and you don't know sure. until you get them out there, you get feedback on them and you tr you have this iterative cycle, you know, of like putting the software out there, getting people's reaction to it in discourse, which is great. Um, and then building new versions of discourse to address that feedback. So it takes a long time to get good. like. Uh, v1 of software is never going to be the right version right like even v3 well much better is you know we we have a lot of work to do on discourse still uh in my opinion um yeah it, it's way better than it was and it, it, it's great software but it can still be better you know and in this process of this commitment to continual improvement means showing up every day and you know improving things and making it better you know, and yeah. that's what gives work meaning, at least for me, is this idea of like every day we make it a little bit better, um, not just for ourselves, but for our customers and for anyone else using discourse. And Definitely. that's the commitment. That's I, I talked earlier about, like, how do you start a community? Well, you show up, you show up every day, like 90 percent of parenting 
is showing up because <laughs> sure. uh, you're never going to get it all right. Like it's impossible as a parent to get it right. Like it's just, there's no such thing as getting it right in parenting. There's just showing up and doing your best. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and a commitment to, and if other people see that you have that commitment, like you get up, you go to work, you work. I mean, but we don't work weekends and stuff at discourse. Like one of the things I screwed up on in stack overflow was we, we w I would work weekends <laughs> and I would work all the time, <laughs> but at discourse, I was like, no, let's work like nine to five. We're not going to work weekends, but at the same time, like we're going to work, we're going to work really okay. hard to make this as good as we can make it and be really committed to having these great relationships with our customers where they're happy and they have happy communities. Right. And it's a fun, really, really challenging problem because getting people to get along is not easy. It's one of the hardest problems in computer science, um, getting people to get along, you know? Yeah. So I, I enjoy the work. I enjoy the mission. And, you know, I hopefully when you're using discourse, that comes across in your use of discourse as well. Like, you know, we want things to be as good as they can be here for us as well as for customers. And yeah. that's a powerful message to send. It's a powerful message to live. And you live it by doing it. You get up every day and you start anew and you're invigorated, right? So yeah. what, what, what's your, this is the final, final, final question. Uh, and we're gonna wrap up, Jeff. What, what, is, your, what is your motivation? Like what, what is driving you to do this? You said, you know, you've got to show up every day. You've got to, it's a long, it's a long game. What, what's your motivation? What, what, are you, what are you achieving? Well, I, w I will say it, it does bring me happiness to arrive um, when I'm searching for stuff on the internet and I hit uh, a Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange site uh, and get information that I needed. That's incredibly gratifying, right? Like mm -hmm. I've built a system that works. It worked for me. Like I, I, I did a search and I got really good, useful information from yeah. one of the sites that, you know, I didn't put the information on there, but we did the framework for it. Sure. Uh, similarly for discourse, like I, one of the greatest compliments we've gotten recently was from someone who said, you can tell an open source project is good when you go there and there's a discourse instance. And I was like, wow, what a compliment, right? Like <laughs> you can tell that they care about their community, right? They have a community and they, they cared enough to use like really good cutting edge, nice software that you know, it's like walking into like a clean, well-lit store, you know, it just yeah. gives you a good feeling. It's like, ah, oh, nice. Like th these are, these are people who know what they're doing and actually care. Um, so that's, that's why I do it. Like I, I ultimately selfishly want things to be better for myself, <laughs> but also for everyone else. Right. Like, and yeah. I, I just want the opposite of the company town where everything is on Facebook and, you know, you're just giving away diamonds ultimately at the end of the day like you're if your only presence is on facebook you've handed over the keys to your empire to mark zuckerberg and why yeah. would you do that uh, you know yes and you can have a pre and you should have a presence on facebook but why not have your own stuff too because that's yeah. and if you look at like netflix for example netflix has started and all the 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 you know, like Hulu, all the other broadcast, you know, networks realize like the value is in them creating their own stuff, right? Like yeah. if you're just licensing content from other people, you're constantly at their mercy, right? Netflix is at the mercy of the people who license them. I don't know, the license to, to view friends, the show, right? Yeah. But if Netflix builds their own friends, they can now write their own, you know, checkbook right yeah, uh they control everything and that's where you want to be headed like you want a mixture right you don't want to create everything but you want to have control over the things that you create and be creating things that matter to everybody else like you know you want to be disney in the end right but how did disney didn't get there by licensing stuff disney got there by creating their own stuff and you should yeah. too Amazing. I think it's a great way to wrap up. Um, Jeff, thank you so much. This has been eye-opening to me. I know I've had a ton of comments as well saying how, how eye-opening it was to people. So um, thank you so much. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, your, what you're talking about, what you're, what you're doing right now? Uh, well, of course, discourse.org. That's the main place yeah. to start. And then if you're curious about me personally, uh, blog.codinghorror.com, uh, which I haven't updated in a while. I blame the pandemic. But um, I, I promise I will be blogging again soon. Uh, but thank you for this opportunity, and and I I hope it was useful. Oh, my pleasure, and it's been really really useful, and I just appreciate you taking the time out to uh, to chat with me. So yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate All it. All right, you're welcome. Take Bye care. everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye bye.